So take your Bibles, if you will. Now, all week we've been in the Gospels. Uh, we've been in Luke, we've been in Matthew, and, and uh, we kind of surveyed around in there and jumped around a little bit. I want you to go to the book of Genesis, if you will. The book of Genesis, I don't really need to preach this message because, because John did a very good job of it when he talked about Job. And, uh, and so uh, uh, that, uh, that, was, that was quite, it was actually halfway through his lesson before I understood who Joe was. <laughs> so I really like that. I really like that a great deal, but um, just go to Genesis chapter 45, and we'll join you there in a moment. We've talked about a lot of things this week pertaining to revival. Uh, we've asked ourselves how we could know that we need revival, and uh, we talked about uh, how we can do more than others to be second mile saints. Uh, we found out what it takes to be a, uh, a, a, a heart uh, church with a heart for the city. And uh, we've explored the question of uh, what's the price to pay for revival. And in the Sunday school hour, we look at what happens when the winds of adversity change direction and hit you from another way. Well, let me tell you something, friend. You're not, you're not responsible for the wind. Those disciples that were put in the boat that were, uh, were told to go out and get in the boat and get on over the other side of the sea, they were doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They were being obedient. The way is not always the way of obedience is not always easy. Amen. But you're not responsible for the wind. You're not responsible for those uh, those types of things. You just keep looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. So we we look to see how we can trust in God. Now the subject I bring you this morning, <coughs> again, it's not a subject that you would think is appropriate necessarily for a revival setting, but I assure you that it is. For you see, until we have learned to forgive or ask someone for forgiveness from a genuine heart, our efforts to see revival will be in vain. And our work for the Lord will be checkmated and nonplussed and paralyzed. We will not walk in the power of the Holy Spirit see with, with His sealing and anointing uh, uh, on our ministry if we have not forgiven another brother or sister in the Lord or even one outside the body of Christ. Uh, so I assure you that this is a message that is for this hour. Um, I hope and I believe that this is by divine appointment uh, that somebody here this morning for the first time or maybe somebody listening on Facebook for the first time in years maybe will be set free. There's something within us that uh, though we remember, sometimes we like to remember. And there's something within us that needs to stop loving to remember. There was an Irish lady named Bridget who was telling her friend one day that she had been to her, she had been to confession. And, um, and so she was telling her uh, uh, what she had been, she said, well, surely, Bridget, you didn't have anything to confess. She said, oh, but I did. She said, I was trying to get an ice cube out of the ice tray, and it stuck on me, and, it, 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 and then I said a hard thing, and then I ran my mother-in-law out of the room with a broom. And her friend said, oh, but Bridget, that was over a year ago. Surely you've been to confession since. She said, oh, yes, I've been every week because I do so love to remember it. <laughs> There's something within us that needs to stop loving to remember. And just like it is possible, you know, for a, for a plane to get off course during flight, uh, so many times there are things that blow us this way and things that blow us that way, and yet God is capable of, a, of, be, of getting us home. Such was the issue in Joe's life. Such was the issue in Joseph's life in the Old Testament book of Genesis and his life kind of makes you wonder, God, something is terribly gone wrong here. God, we know where you want him to be, and we know where he ends up, but it's like he's been blown off course here. And you see that throughout the life of Joseph. But the interesting thing is this, that Joseph's life, in, in his life, God gets him to the precise place at the precise moment, exactly where God wants him to be to save not just the world in which he lived, but also to save the Hebrew people. 
his brothers. His brothers and his father uh, and that race of people from which the Messiah will eventually come. Jacob, as you know, had 12 sons. You know that from Scripture. And, 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 and though Joseph was not his oldest son, Jacob was certainly his favorite. And you're going to see how a father's favoritism can prove fatal for a family. Mm -hmm. Not a good idea to play favorites. Jacob grew up in a home where his, he was his mother's favorite and his twin brother Esau was his father's favorite. Folks, that entire family was dysfunctional. I, I've often thought that my next book I might write might be on the dysfunctional family of God, you know, just based on that. <laughs> uh, it was dysfunctional to the core because Jacob came out of dysfunction. Uh, dysfunctional situation. Remember that whole coat of many colors story that uh, that Jacob did in his years where he made that uh, coat of many colors for uh, Joseph. You learned that in VBS with all the cookies and Kool Aid and all of that, you know. And I, I can remember as a ch as an older child even thinking, Jacob, why would you do that? Remember this verse from, from uh, Genesis 37. You don't need to turn there. We'll put it for you on the screen. Genesis 37, verse 3. Now Israel, that's Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his sons because he was the son of his old age and he made him a very colored tunic. Now, let's just soak on that for just a moment. Maybe you'll begin to see something here. That, that whole concept of multicolored uh, or of many colors comes out of the original languages. And it, most likely it's garments in that, that, that day that were multicolored. But the interesting thing about this particular garment is not that it was multicolored as you've always thought. Uh, and and you've been taught in BBS and Sunday school and all of that. The original, original rendering meant that it literally covered the extremities. I mean, it went all the way down to the floor and it went all the way down to the hands. And, and, and here's the weird thing about that coat. Why would he need that? They didn't work in, those, in that type of clothing in the fields in those days. It would have been too hot. It would have been too constricting, just like it is down in Texas. You wouldn't wear something like that. Of course, I did ask a road construction guy. I said, why am I seeing always, all you guys are always wearing long sleeve shirts in 103 degree weather? Well, that's because of the, the heat of the sun. It's damaging to the body. And so they understand that. But in, in, in this heavy environment of this, this, uh, this hot environment, that heavy of a coat would have been too constricting. And, and so you say, why is all that important? Well, don't you get it? Jacob gave Joseph the garment of a supervisor. He did. He gave him a garment of an overlord. And essentially in giving him this garment... Jacob had no idea, J Jacob had no use in, 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 in no concept and no thought of Joseph working out in, in the fields. But his intention was that Joseph would be the overseer over the boys of the family. And when you study the life of those boys, you find out they were rotten to the core. I mean, they, I mean, they killed every man in Shechem. Uh, in retaliation for their sister being raped. And when you study their lives, you can see why Reuben, who was the oldest, and, and you can see uh, why he could never leave this family. So Jacob is making a statement here to these boys that Joseph is the boss. Joseph's in charge. But it didn't even stop there. He gave a plot of ground to Joseph. And we learn that from the New Testament. Uh, but, but, but Jacob did this for Joseph, and he didn't provide any of that, so far as we know, for the other boys. Now, if that weren't enough, Joseph's given this other gift of prophetic dreams. Joseph, you remember that Joseph had, uh, uh, had dreams that his brothers would actually bow down to him. It's put this way in chapter 37 and verse 9. Now, he still had another dream. And related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Well, the Bible does not teach us that at the age of 17, Joseph was the brightest kid on the block. Okay? 
I mean, I, yes, God gave him the dream, but that didn't mean he was supposed to go and run and tell it to his brothers and plan it. <laughs> and it made his brothers so angry, they wanted to kill him. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Moms and dads, grandparents, every child is a gift of God. Every child, and might I add, every stepchild is a gift of God. And when that child was born, there were no mistakes and there were no accidents, even if it, you're not the biological parent or whatever. We're not here just because of a simple biological process. Do you understand that? You are here by the design of a sovereign God, and no matter who you are, what your background is, or who your parents were, or where you came from, God has a purpose in your life. And your children might be as different as night and day. And I promise you, they are. But you, every child that you have, or child that you are raising, or, or whatever, is a gift of God, and they deserve your love, attention, nurture, uh, uh, you know... I understand. Some, some children require more attention than other children. I get that. We have a special needs child, and I, I, I mentioned her a little bit, about her a little bit in the preface of my book there. But, um, so so I, I understand that different children require more supervision than, than others. But as a parent and a step-parent or, or, or whatever you find yourself in, that is uh, because this is an easy trap to fall into if you're a step parent. If there's one thing you should never do, ever, never play favorites with your children. You know why? Because God doesn't play favorites with us. He doesn't love me more than he loves you. He doesn't love you more than he loves me. Do you believe God loves you as much as he loved Billy Graham? Yeah. Do you believe God loves you as much as he loves your pastor? Yeah. See, I hope you believe that because if you don't believe that, you're accusing God of being an emotionalist who just loves with his feelings and God can't do that. But Jacob did not learn from his past and consequently Joseph's brothers hated Joseph so much they wanted to kill him. They would have done it if some Ishmaelites had not turned up about that and that was plan B. So Reuben and Judah actually thought, hey, well, let's not shed blood. But Reuben and Judah are not entirely innocent in this because they sold Joseph off to Ishmaelites. They took that coat of many colors. They dipped it into the blood of a goat. Of course, now we could do DNA testing on it and we could find out the real story. But they dipped it in the blood of a goat, laid it before Jacob, and, and, and Jacob took the bait. And he cries and he says, a wild beast has devoured my son and I will go to my grave in mourning. Mm -hmm. And the boys quietly tiptoe out and say, he fought him. We got away with it. By the way, that's still bearing false witness. Even though they did not tell him that he was killed. They said they were going to tell him that he was killed by this goat. They didn't tell him that. He just came to that, Jacob just came to that conclusion, but that's still bearing false witness. Uh, and so it's, it, it's just as good as a bold-faced lie. Be rest assured that your sin will find you out. Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward 22 years, and Joe is going to once again see his brothers. They come to Egypt to buy food. And because of the famine that's going on up there in Israel, what they do not know is that the prime minister of Egypt is their brother Joseph. And when they come begging for food, then, then he knows who they are. They don't recognize who he is. He has learned Egyptian. He speaks to them through an interpreter. He's wearing this Egyptian garb. And, and it, it, this is a literal fulfillment of that dream that one day you will bow down to me. You know, he probably could have thought that, you know, someday he would look at his brothers and say, gotcha. Mm -hmm. He could now throw the book at them. And he was in a position to do just that very thing. Because he had the power second only to Pharaoh. But instead of throwing the book at him, instead of saying, gotcha, he begins to sob. Mm -hmm. Because it's the new Joseph now. 
and he has decided to reveal his identity to his brother. So we take up the reading in Genesis 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed. They were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, please come near me. They came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a, re a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph. And you might be interested to know here that he tells his brothers exactly what to say. This is what you say when you go to dad. Okay? He quotes for them what they're supposed to say. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not delay. Verse 10. And you shall come and live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come, lest you and your household and all that you have be impoverished. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. And you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt, and all that you have seen. And you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept on them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. The message that I bring you this morning is born from what at that time was probably the greatest trial I had ever gone through in my life. It was a time when the future looked so bleak, and I was angry, I was bitter. How could people be like this? And it hurt so much that I couldn't tell anybody. Years later, a dear friend, Robert Jeffress, who was, at that time he was pastoring in Wichita Falls, not Dallas, but now he's in Dallas. He, he comforted me during a desperate hour when my daughter was in a car accident. I decided to tell Robert everything that uh, I knew uh, that, I had, that had happened because I knew that he wouldn't tell anybody about the situation of what they did. If I'm totally honest with you, the reason that I told Robert was for him to put his arm around me and say, well, David, you ought to be angry. You know, get it off your chest. And I guess that's what I wanted. Instead, he said something very different, and if I could narrow down for you 30 years of ministry down to my, what would be the five minutes of my finest hour, it was when Robert looked at me and he said something to me that I will never forget. He softly and emphatically told me, David, you must totally forgive them, because until you do, you will be in chains. Release them. And you will be released. Nobody had ever really talked to me like that. I guess faithful are the wounds of a friend, though. I said, Robert, I can't. He said, David, you can and you must. I have to tell you, it was the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. Not many people do what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. But I'm talking to someone here this morning, and maybe you're in such bondage, you're in such full bitterness. And you're living in a pit and you cannot get over what has happened. And I want you to know I understand. Perhaps if I'd heard your story, I would have 
I, I, I would see that, man, I haven't gone through anything like what you've gone through. Suppose, suppose we could hear everyone's story this morning. We line them up here on the platform. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody here that was abused as a child. and You've never gotten over it. There's somebody here this morning and your husband and wife or your husband or, or, or your wife would was unfaithful to you, maybe in a previous marriage even. There's someone here this morning who's been hurt by a church leader. There's one here this morning who has been lied about and everybody believes the lie and there is no way you're ever going to be able to make them believe the truth. There is someone here this morning that's bitter over the way their parents treated them. Bitter <laughs> over the way that your kids turned out. The career situation did not go as planned, etc., etc. In this conversation that I had with my friend Robert, he said to me, David, I got a letter one time from England. He said, I've been preaching there, and when I got home, uh, this letter beat me there. And it was a lady who had been present in the congregation, uh, and she'd written me this letter. She described what their son-in-law had done to their daughter and to their grandchildren, and it was horribly disgusting. Yeah. And at the end of the letter, she said in the letter, she said, do I have to forgive him? And David, he said, the hardest thing I had to do was write her back and tell her, yes, you do. You have to forgive him. Suppose we could hear everyone's story if we had the time, and then we decide to vote at the one who has been hurt the most. And let's say that you won the election. Would you then say, see there, I told you so. I told you I suffered. Now do you believe me? Or would you realize that even if you got voted as the one who suffered the most, the angels would not say, why, you, you're, you poor soul. In fact, they probably would say, congratulations. And do you understand why? Because the greater the suffering, the greater the anointing. I don't know about you folks. I would rather have the greater anointing than anything else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you go through that kind of hurt, listen to me, when you go through that kind of trouble and that heartache, <laughs> maybe some of you have been the object of, of prejudice. Or, or, or maybe there's someone here this morning and you, you were raped and you can't hardly think of anything else. I can tell you this. If you have suffered deeply, and only the Lord knows how much, and you have seen it up to now as a rationale for being angry and bitter. You don't realize that you have the potential and the anointing and the blessing and the usefulness that the person around you doesn't have because they haven't suffered like you have. And so instead of being the reason for your anger and bitterness, what you ought to do is you ought to let it be the means to catapult you into an anointing of the Spirit where God can use you like never before. Who would have ever thought that Joseph would one day be prime minister in Egypt? And you know what his only gifting was? Prophetic dreams. I mean, you think about it. Think about if somebody came into your HR department. They said, well, thank you for coming in today. What, 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 tell us, what do you do? I dream. <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for coming in. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll get back. You don't call us, we'll call you. And, and you may feel that your gifting is about as insignificant as Joseph's, but I can tell you that whatever their, your gifting is, there is something you can do that nobody else can do. But as long as you're bitter and you're angry and you're always like, what? How in the world could this happen to me? You will never know what God can do with you because single-handedly you are disqualifying yourself from the anointing of God. Hear me. Set them free. And you will be set free. I don't care how great the hurt. Because the greater the hurt, the greater the anointing. So if you're holding on to a grudge against anybody. And again, maybe if we heard the story, we would say, man, I don't see how you coped. I don't see how you met. But if you're holding on to any type of grudge for anybody, for anything, then any degree of unforgiveness it is an invitation for the devil to walk right in and just destroy your anointing. And i got to ask you, are you really willing to let him do that?
David, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how much I've been hurt. That's fine for you, David. You're supposed to talk like that. You're the preacher. But I'm just not that way. I'm not a Joseph. And I don't have time to go into this, but this is why I wrote about this. I don't think Joseph was just that way either. I have reason to believe from earlier chapters that he wasn't that way. Forgiveness was not automatic with Joseph. It took years of maturation and growth and change in that old boy. I'm telling you, God took Joseph to the woodshed. Do you understand what that illustration is? Do well, you understand what that means? And you're right. I don't know what you've gone through. I, I don't know what it is that's taken you to task. But I can tell you this, that right now, as long as we justify our anger and we justify our hurt, we give the devil permission to do anything he wants to in our life. And we would never know what God could do with us. Why do you want to give that devil that much control of your life. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that if I ask the question, how many of you here have forgiven those who have hurt you? Uh, I'm, I'm sure that you probably would say I have. Mm -hmm. I don't doubt that as best you know how, uh, I, I'm sure that you have, or at least you've done an, made an attempt to do what is right. But I want to make this proposition to you. If I should uncover this morning the fact that you haven't embraced forgiveness would you be willing to say I realize I haven't but now I will and I'm asking you that because before this meeting is over this morning I'm going to give you an opportunity to come out of the pit okay so the question is how do you know that you have forgiven the person or persons people who have hurt you and that full forgiveness embraced in your heart has taken place. How do you know? What's the proof? Now, these are not exhaustive. You may be able to think of some other, uh, uh, other ways to know. And I have no doubt that maybe even you might even disagree with some things that I'm going to say this morning. That's okay. But God gave these to me and he told them to share with the world before he takes me home someday. So, I just have to be faithful to present them to you. And you... Draw your own conclusion. Six of these this morning. Proof number one. You do not tell anybody what they did to you. Now, let's define the word they. Who is they? The, them or they refers, obviously, to the people or, or, or the person who's hurt you. Okay? You don't tell anybody what they did. Look at verse 1 of chapter 45 again. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. Why did Joseph make everybody leave? Well, I can tell you why. Because, you see, he's going to try to persuade his brothers to come live in Egypt. He wants to make sure that nobody in Egypt knows anything about what his brothers did to him 22 years prior. These brothers are going to be the catalysts for the 12 tribes of the Hebrew nation. We don't need to start off their life in Egypt with all of Egypt knowing about his past. You understand, there's a greater good here and a greater need for the future than just getting even with the past and reconciling with the past. He's going to protect their identity and their destiny, so he says, everybody get out. I can imagine the interpreter thinks he's going to be needed, uh, but no, Joseph says, interpreter, out. And now behind closed doors, Joseph sobbing through his heart, not out of bitterness or anger, but because he loved them so very much. He reveals his identity in, to them in such a way and makes sure that nobody in Egypt would ever know what they did to him. Let me ask you, why do we tell what they did to us? Why is it when someone hurts us, First thing we do is get on the phone and say, well, let me tell you what I've been through. Let me tell you what he did. Let me tell you what they said behind my back. It's because we can't stand it if the person who hurt us is going to be admired by anybody. We don't want them to be liked. We don't want them to be loved. We don't want them to be appreciated. We want to minimize their credibility. And that's why we tell what they did. Joseph knew that he was a hero in Egypt right now. 
Egyptians are drinking from the fountains of rejoicing because right now of Joseph's administration during that famine might have rivaled some of the best business practices and instruction out of Harvard School of Business. Mm -hmm. He's a hero right now. But he knew if word leaked out, all of Egypt would hate those guys. Which is exactly what he used to want. But it's the new Joseph now. You see, the reason that he is there as prime minister is because he could be trusted with greatness. God is looking for somebody who is devoid of bitterness so that whatever greatness God has in store for that person's life, it can actually shine forth. Joseph is now going to make sure nobody finds out what happened. By the way, how would you like it if we all knew this morning that everything that God knows about you, what if we just revealed oh, no. it all up on the screen right here? Okay, we'll just start with the pastor right here. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that God, I, you know what, I, I'm glad God doesn't do us that way. Yeah. Amen. Uh, I wouldn't like it either. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like for you to know some things about my past. And you know what? You will never know. And I will never know about you and all that God knows. And that's because as far as the east is from the west... So far are our transgressions removed from us because the blood of Jesus Christ washes away from all sins. And Amen. You'll never know. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and I'll never know about you, and that's as it should be. But when God knows full well what he has forgiven me of, and then I turn around and I pass judgment on you, God says, no, 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 wait a minute. We're not working on the old man again. Remember? Yeah. Wait a minute. How dare you do that? Since when did you become sinless? Proof number one that you have forgiven is that you tell nobody what they did. There are three exceptions. The next slide will reveal this out. First of all, testifying in the court of law. I'll give you an example, case in point. A lady came to my office one time and, and, and where I passed her and she said, they found my rapist. I said, that's good, he's been found. And she said, well, they want me to testify in a court of law. And I said, and you should testify. And she said, oh, oh, but I have forgiven him and I don't want to testify. The Bible teaches me to forgive. But I said, but listen to me, he's a danger. Mm -hmm. And she said, but if they send him back to a particular Middle Eastern country, they, they, he'll be beheaded. And, I, and I've forgiven him. I said, you must testify and you must do what's right. It is not personal bitterness. God has given you the victory, but now it is your duty. She did testify. They sent him back, and that's all we knew. We never found out any other details. So that is one exception, lawfully, in order to protect other citizens. Okay? There's another exception, and that would be this. For counseling or therapeutic reasons, you may need to tell one other person, only one, for counseling or therapeutic reasons, uh, you may need some help to get over whatever it is that they hurt you with. And sometimes we all need someone we can tell. Someone that uh, we know will never tell anybody. I told Robert I knew he would carry it to his grave. No point in making an appointment with him and you, you trying to go in there and ask him what it was. He will not tell you. <laughs> he will not tell you. He will not answer your question. You can tell one a professional counselor or otherwise, but not two, not three, not four, not ten, not ten, you know, twenty. Okay? There's a third exception, and that would be for a second opinion. You know, sometimes you've you've gone to somebody and you feel like, well, you know, I used up my tell one card, you know, and but I feel like the information I've received is wrong counsel. It's okay to seek out a second opinion. As long as it doesn't become a habitual thing. And more could be said about that, but I'll move on. So proof number one, you don't tell anybody what they did. Here's proof number two. Proof number two that you have know that you have forgiven. You will not let them feel afraid of you. Okay? Look in verse three. You will not let them feel afraid of you. And verse three bears this out. So then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were spooked. They were frightened. They were terrified. Remember when the disciples saw Jesus out walking on the water? And it says that and they, were, they, they were terrified. They were, 
It was like, was, oh no, it's a Halloween ghost, you know. Yeah, it's kind of like this situation right here. Here's the funny thing. That's what Joseph used to want more than anything else in the world. He wanted them to be terrified. Now he's got it. And he says, like, you, no, you don't understand. Come close to me. I'm your brother. He did not want them to feel afraid. See, when you have not forgiven someone, you want them to be in fear of you. You walk into a room where that person is, and they freeze up, and you think, yep, I got you now. Yeah, love it. Sometimes husbands and wives play this game. No, you shouldn't love it. 1 Corinthians 13.5 says that love keeps no record of wrongs. Mm -hmm. One writer wrote, this does not mean that love is blind. When we love, we may recognize problems and failures in people, but we do not lose faith in the possibilities of what they become. Mm -hmm. You heard about the husband who said to his wife, said, you know, I thought you forgave me. She said that was last week. <laughs> I have a feeling that maybe there's somebody here this morning and maybe you were given a talent, maybe you were given some sort of a prophetic word years ago, God was going to use you, whatever, and it, and it never happened. You wonder, how long, Lord, and I can tell you how long, it will be as long as it takes to bring you to the place where God brought Joseph to, that he embraced forgiveness with his brothers. Proof number one, you don't tell anybody what they did. Proof number two, you will not let them be afraid of you. And here's proof number three. You will not even let them feel guilty. He says, I'm your brother Joseph. And then he goes on now to verse five. And now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. Hey, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever sent a person on a guilt you can raise your hands if you want to. Okay, all right. Some of you are just not being honest, or you maybe you like anonymity. Huh? Okay, all right, that's fine. But you know what it's like to keep some. But how many of you know what it is like for somebody to put you on a guilt trip? Yeah, that's easier to raise your hand to. Huh? Setting people on guilt trips is one of the most demonic things that we can do, because you see, we are cruel, cold-hearted people if we get enjoyment or receive feelings of entitlement from that. And Joseph is saying now, don't be angry with yourselves. You understand what he's doing? He's setting them free. You get that? He's making sure they're not going to feel any guilt. But you know, a lot of people come up with loopholes that allows them to stay in their bitterness. And, and they say, well, you know, you don't have to forgive them unless they're sorry. Oh, really? So where did you get that? Yeah. I know where you did not get that. Yeah. Exactly. You did not get that in there. Mm -hmm. You have to decide this morning whether you want to live under the old covenant or the new covenant. You're going to live in the old man or you're going to live in the new man. Okay? And what? This, this whole thing of an eye for an eye. You know, that's kind of what's going on in the Middle East right now. That's what, kind of what's been going on in the Middle East. Probably will until, until the end of time. It never stops. This tit for tat, this, this concept of forgiveness, it doesn't exist with either Islam or Judaism. It's, it's, but, it's, but it is the Christian gospel that gave us something that you cannot find anywhere else when Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. And, and as for the idea, you don't have to forgive them until they're sorry. Well, I seem to recall Jesus saying on the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Now, how much repentance do you think there and how much sorry do you think there was at the cross by those who didn't even know what they were doing? There was none. Jesus didn't wait to forgive them until they were sorry. The funny thing is that the people who have hurt you, they probably don't even know that they've done anything wrong. By the way, if this sermon kind of convicts you a little bit when the service is over, may I suggest don't walk over to somebody in the auditorium and say, now, in light of David's sermon, I just want you to know that I forgive you. And they'll look at you and say, for what? <laughs> 
And you will say, well, you know what? I'm saying, no, I don't. Well, you should. <laughs> and now you've got a fight on your hands, which is probably what you wanted anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who could know it. Now, when we go up to a person and we say, I just want you to know I forgive you. It's usually because we have. We want to make sure that they know that we were hurt. And so we just kind of stick the knife in just a little bit further. The only time, listen carefully, the only time you say, I forgive you, is when they are wanting to hear that more than anything in the world. But Joseph said, don't be angry with yourselves. You don't have to wait for them to admit it. Uh, before you forgive them. You know, folks, the people who hurt me, you could have put them under a lie detector test and they probably didn't think they'd done anything wrong. By the way, when you realize that's the way that we are, don't forget, folks, that's the way. Don't forget, we're a lot like that too. Um, there are people that are hurting because of you and me and we're not even aware of the fact that we hurt them. We may never know. Point is, people that have hurt you, don't wait for them to say, I'm sorry, to intentionally forgive them, or you will spend the rest of your life in bitterness and depression. How do you know you've totally forgiven? Proof number one, you don't tell anybody what they did. Proof number two, you won't let them be afraid of you. Proof number three, you won't even let them feel guilty. And here's proof number four, you will let them save face. You will let them save face. And now do not be angry or grieve with yourselves, for because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life, for the famine has been in the land these two years, and there's still five years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth, and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now therefore, was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all of his household ruler over all of Egypt. Those brothers are looking at each other and saying, gee, did we hear him right? Reuben, I can just see now, his car says, Reuben, did we hear him right? We didn't send him here? He, he, he God sent him here? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And, 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 and so what, it's, it's like you, you cover for the person. Wasn't it Dale Carnegie who said, uh, if you let another person save face, you win a friend for life? And see, if that's the way God is with us. He lets us save face. And so J Joseph is saying, look, it wasn't you who sent me here. It was God. I can, I can imagine this conversation. They're just stunned. And Joseph overhears their conversation. and says, well, yeah, that's exactly right. You had me right. You heard, you heard what I said. It's as simple as this, guys. God needed somebody to get here first, and he promised our great-great-grandfather uh, Abraham that we would go to Egypt and, and that we would eventually come out of Egypt. And, and uh, so God said, um, uh, let's see, uh, Joseph, you go. Okay? As simple as that, guys. Forgiveness embraced will lead us to an emancipation. From self-righteousness where we stop pointing the finger because we realize more and more, there go I by, by the grace of God. Amen. And so Joseph declares it wasn't them who did it, but God meant it for good. It's too good to be true, which is like the Christian gospel when you first heard it. It's like, I can't believe it. Yeah, it's too good to be true. <clears throat> and these brothers just can't take it in. And then suddenly panic hits themselves. And they're like, uh-oh, we know what's coming next. Joseph had forgiven us, but he's going to send us back to Canaan, and now we got to tell Dad what happened. We would have all said, well, that's on you, buddy. Yeah, serves your rights. You had it coming. You made your bed, now go lie in it, huh? They would have rather died than to have to do that. And Joseph knew that. That's why he told his brothers word for word, here's what you say when you go back. He coached them. You can read it further when you get home. He will not even let them tell them what they did. And that's exactly the way God is with us. Look, folks, we've all got skeletons in our closet. We do. 
And God is not anxious to yank those skeletons out and dance them before uh, others to embarrass us or harass us before our brothers and sisters. Why should we want to do that to somebody else? Mm -hmm. And Joseph is making it so easy for them. You go back home and here's what you say. You let them save face. Proof number five. You protect them from their deepest, darkest secret. You protect them from their deepest, darkest secret. There is some of you in this room today, you know something about somebody, and if you were to tell that, it would destroy their life. And you say, you know what, I could hurt you. Maybe I will. Well, maybe I won't. I might. You know, maybe I'll tell it someday. And you've got that person living under perpetual terror that one day you might tell them. Can you imagine Jesus being like that? How dare we say we want a greater anointing and we threaten somebody. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness embraced means that you protect them from their deepest, darkest secret. It does not mean that you condone what they did. But you protect them. My time is gone. Proof number six. The final proof that you have embraced forgiveness, and this is probably the most important. You will do this for them as long as you live. Mm -hmm. This is an aspect of forgiveness that many people do not choose to partake in. It's a life sentence. You've got to keep doing it. Sometime back uh, when I pastored in Oklahoma, shortly after I arrived at that church, I was mediating a dispute against a couple of men in the church. And one man said this phrase to me while in private. He said, and here's the quote, I have a long memory. I have a long memory. In fact, I, I actually heard that same exact phrase from the other man involved in the controversy. Interesting, strange how that happens. He said, I have a long memory. Now, when I heard that, I just kind of filed it away in my heart. Could I suggest something to you this morning? When you stand in the presence of Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth. You stand before that one to whom no heart is closed, but every heart is an open book. When you stand in the presence and the light, the holiness of God, the last thing in eternity you want to hear him say to you is I have a long memory. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. You want to say, oh Lord, do you not remember about Psalm 103 about the east and the west? Uh, Oh, Lord, you not remember Micah 7 about burying him in the sea? You don't want to hear him say to you, I have a long memory. You understand something, according to the word of our Lord throughout all of Scripture, including Paul's words in Ephesians 4.30, about forgiving one another as Christ has forgiven you, then you understand if you have a long memory, you had better start suffering from some holy amnesia before you stand in God's presence. How unlike most of us, God is. Now, I did not say we forget. You know, forgive and forget, frankly, I don't even think that's humanly possible. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking about is the attitude of loving to remember. We've got to stop that. There's something within us that needs to just let <clears throat> that stop. So you do it today, and you forgive tomorrow, and you choose to forgive the next day. Mm -hmm. 17 years after old Jacob had died, the brothers panicked. Some scholars will disagree with me, but I believe the boys made up the story. And it comes in chapter 50. And they say, well, you know, uh, they say, well, you know, uh, the way you interpret it, David, it, it's not quite a technical. Here's what I think. They make up this story and they come to their father, or they come to their brother Joseph. And they say, before our dad died, uh, he asked us to ask you to please forgive us. And Joseph begins to cry, and he can't believe it. He's like, what's the matter with you guys? I told you 17 years ago I forgave you. And it's lasted all these years. And, 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 and I forgave you then, and I will forgive you now. And I want you to see that he says he'll provide. Look, look at this verse right here coming up, this next verse. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result, to preserve 
many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. I bet that's the most precious thing you've read all day. I will provide for you and your little ones. He did not want them to feel like he had not forgiven them. Forgiveness embraced is a life sentence. And the people that you have to forgive, you don't just get over it like that. You had to do it yesterday, you have to do it today, you'll have to do it all over again tomorrow. The people I had to forgive, it took years before I finally had forgiven them. But you know what I decided? Peace is better. I did. You must set them free. Once in a while, the devil will come back to me and walk me over the head and point out what they did wrong. The Lord said to me in an airport one day, he said, David, before you get on an airplane, I want you to pray for me. I said, Lord, I pray for him. He said, David, I want you to mean it. <laughs> okay, I mean it. The Lord said, David, look, I cannot give you the anointing you seek for unless you pray that for them. I said, I can't. I can pray for them and hope that they repent before you, but I can't ask you to bless their lives. And friend, as the Lord is my witness, I never had peace over this issue until that day in Robert's office. And he said, David, you can and you must. I left that office that day. And I want you to know, and for a certainty in my soul, I had set them free. I had set them free. I had set them free for the rest of my life. It's a life sentence. You do it today, you do it tomorrow, and you do it forever. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, hear me this morning. If you want out of the pit, set them free. And you will be set free, and then you keep on doing it. You don't have to be stepped on for the rest of your life. You don't have to be made to feel like they've got the upper hand on you. You don't have to allow yourself to be the object of their cruelty. But until you set them free, you will not be free. So proof number one, you don't tell anybody what they did to you. Proof number two, you will not let them be afraid of you. Number three, you'll not even let them feel guilty. Number four, you let them save face. Number five, you will protect them from their deepest, darkest secrets. And number six, you'll do it for the rest of your life. Now, if you come up to me at the end of the service and you say, well, now David, I listened to your message. And I, I, I want you to know that back in 1971, so-and-so did such-and-such -such to me. I want you to know I've forgiven them. Then I will know you have. You've been sentenced for life. And when you realize you've been sentenced for life, that's when you realize... You have set them free and you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed.